So I'm Peter Kalmus. I am a data scientist. That's my official title at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I'm speaking on my own behalf. And um, I have a PhD in physics from Columbia. I use the phrase global heating to describe the fact that the planet is getting hotter. It's about 1.1 degrees Celsius hotter than it should be right now, than it was before humans started heating it up by emitting greenhouse gases. And climate change, I don't, I don't even really use that phrase anymore. I usually say climate breakdown. So we're burning fossil fuels, which is the main thing that we're doing to make the planet get hotter. And we're emitting these things called greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which are basically radiatively active molecules that block outgoing infrared radiation. So there's all this sunlight streaming into the planet, which heats it up, of course, you can feel it on a sunny day. And then to stay in an energy balance, the Earth emits an equal amount of radiation back into space in the form of lower frequency infrared radiation. I would say there's hardly any part of the surface of the planet right now that isn't being affected by climate breakdown, I guess you can say. Yeah, so in Southern California, we are seeing um, increased droughts. We're seeing increased wildfires, less snowpack, um, definitely more heat waves, hotter summers, hotter winters too. Um, hotter daytime temperatures, hotter nighttime temperatures, changes in precipitation like the drought. Um, and this, you know, we're seeing this other parts of the world too, more wildfires in Europe, in Russia, in Australia, of course. Um, ecosystems that I'm particularly worried about are the Amazon rainforest and coral reefs. Right now, actually, as we're taping this, there's a, a pretty bad ocean heat wave, which is affecting almost the entire Great Barrier Reef. So a couple of years ago, there was an ocean heat wave that really took out, all, like did a lot of damage in the northern half of the Great Barrier Reef. Right now, we're, we're seeing another ocean heat wave, which isn't quite as intense, but it's affecting the entire Great Barrier Reef. And what's really um, kind of alarming about this is it's coming just a couple of years after. It takes the coral reef several years to recover. Um, and so we're, we're seeing you know, year after year now, ocean heat waves affecting the reefs. So we might be living through a tipping point right now in terms of the planet's coral reefs. Toward the end of the century, we could see um, humid heat waves in the tropics, which could affect hundreds of millions or maybe even billions of people, where it makes it basically uninhabitable for them there because the, the, the many, many days of the year, possibly almost every day of the year, is beyond like humid heat thresholds where our bodies are able to survive because we can't, it's hotter than what, what our bodies are capable of getting rid of the heat, right? So that our sweat stops working, it's really hot and humid, people start going into heat stroke. Um, you know, we used to talk about threats to the agricultural system, right? Which, and those are, those are very real. We're starting to see water scarcity and threats to the agriculture system. Um, we don't talk so much about just humid heat waves making a huge portion of the planet just literally uninhabitable. And it's not something that we can easily come back from, right? We can't just like, uh, people talk about sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere and kind of like going back to a livable planet. Um, I'm highly skeptical Basically, I'll believe that when I see it, because we, we'd have to run our economy essentially in reverse. Our entire economy is based on burning fossil fuels right now. We shouldn't be building new fossil fuel infrastructure. We shouldn't be subsidizing this industry. We should be building out renewable electricity. And something that not enough people are talking about, we should be reducing our use of energy as a society. So I call this demand reduction. And um, it's fascinating to think about demand reduction um, synergistically with renewable electricity production, okay? So, so maybe 30 or 35% of US electricity is already produced carbon free, about 7% from what we think of as, as kind of renewables like solar and wind, um, and then the rest of it from hydro and nuclear, all right? And so if, if, if this much is that 35%, and this is what we're using total, if we reduce our electricity use in half, then we only have to make this much re extra renewable, right? Because we already have a bunch of carbon free. 
But if we don't, we have to make this much. So, so actually the amount of new renewable, new wind power and solar power uh, is about a, a one quarter as much if we can reduce our electricity use by half, right? And we're using, we use more than twice the energy in the US as, uh, per, per person as the average European. So we have, we can definitely be more efficient. We can be driving smaller cars. We can be using less electricity. We can have policies that make the transition away from fossil fuels much, much easier. And there, I mean, again, this is just scratching the surface. The Green New Deal is a, a huge thing. Um, you know, of course, we also have to make sure that this transition, this is a, this is a pretty big transition, our whole economy away from fossil fuels and towards carbon free energy. So we have to make sure it works for everyone so that we have buy-in. Right. The, the, there's very, very powerful um, vested interests that want to keep things the way they are. They want to keep us burning fossil fuels because they profit off of it. All right. Um, so so the, the basically entrenched power structures, the fossil fuel industry is one of the po most powerful industries that the, the world has ever seen. All right. So to and, and a, they, they fund politicians, right? So a lot of politicians want to keep that system going so they can keep winning re-election and keep their jobs. So the, the system as it is really kind of wants to see, this is why we have countries like Canada and other countries and the US saying like, we, we need to reduce our emissions, but they're still, they have all of these plans for new fossil fuel infrastructure. So they're saying one thing and they're doing the opposite, right? Because there's this, so in order to go against that, we need a very powerful grassroots movement. That's the only thing that's going to push back against this huge status quo machine that wants to keep things the way they are. To get that powerful grassroots climate movement, we need this transition to work for everyone, not just, for example, like rich people or middle class people. We need it to work for frontline communities, indigenous communities, communities of color, poor communities, working class communities, and middle class communities. So we, we need this broad coalition that cuts across all sectors of society um, and puts everyone under this big tent of benefiting from this new system. We need to wake up a huge number of people to the fact that this is an emergency so that we get candidates like Bernie Sanders into office and, and climate emergency candidates all up and down the tickets in, in the House, in the Senate, in local elections, you know, in, in, on the Board of Supervisors in Los Angeles and state legislatures. So we need, we need climate emergency candidates you know, from the dog catcher all the way up to the president and in the United Nations. Then we'll start seeing policies emerge like the Green New Deal that I was talking about scientific community. And I believe that Pope Francis is right when he recently stated that if we don't get our act together, we are moving as a planet on a suicidal cause, in a suicidal direction. Fridays for Future is, is, a, is an international sort of movement. Um, that was started by Greta Thunberg's original climate strikes in October of 2018, which were then, which spread around the world. Um, and I think they genuinely stem out of this sense that this is an existential crisis and that it, it doesn't, it, it might feel weird to, to go to school and like be learning stuff and have teachers kind of like acting like everything's normal. Where, while at the back of your mind, you're thinking like, what's my future gonna be like? Should I have kids? You know, is there, is there gonna be food for me? Um, you know, is there going to be an economy? Um, what does it mean to be preparing for jobs when, you know, like the future is so uncertain and we could have like geopolitical instability, which is hard to imagine. It's no, no one knows how this is gonna play out. Like no one knows if, India and Pakistan are gonna have water scarcity, which leads to food shortages, which leads to war between them, which could potentially be nuclear war, which could potentially pull in. No one knows. Like the, these scenarios, I think, are not that far-fetched. And so anyway, this is a meandering answer, I guess. But um, when you realize that this is an actual emergency and that your survival is potentially at stake, then it changes you and you're, you're, you want to speak truth to power. You want to speak to the United Nations. You want to speak to your city council. And, and suddenly maybe taking a very strong stand for climate action 
becomes more important than just staying in school and getting your grades and worrying about college. So, so more and more young people are starting to realize that and students and high school students. And they're, so they're starting to look for ways to actually say to, to the people in charge right now who are living in this older world where they've lived with fossil fuels their, their whole life, they've lived without worrying about climate breakdown their whole life, and they haven't fully internalized what an emergency this really is. But people who are growing up with it, they have a totally different perspective. They're gonna be on the planet longer. They haven't lived with these older norms. And they're coming up with this new sense that this is really an emergency. So, so Fridays for Future, in, in short, it's, it's a school striking movement. Um, and now I think it's becoming more than that because it's been going for over a year and a lot of the young people are starting to think what comes next, right? Um, it's really helped wake up the people on this planet that this is an emergency um, and one thing that i think comes next for fridays for future is something that i'm calling schools for future which is um, a lot of schools are already coming to the same conclusion that they need to band together within the school and activate the school get it to be aware that climate change is an emergency maybe get the administration to sign a pledge to take climate change seriously and then maybe go out into the community and start you know, making noise at city council meetings and um, getting, getting local cities to switch to renewable energy and to make more bike paths and to make more public transportation. And, and you know, schools are the, the place where the young people are right now. They're the ones who get that this is an emergency. They're the ones whose lives are gonna be the most affected. They're on the front lines of this movement, really. I mean, the civil rights movement had to be led by black people. There, there can be no other way. And, and this is the same thing. I feel like the climate movement really has to be led by young people because they're the most affected. So it makes sense for this to start in schools and then to spread out in communities and for the young people to really be pushing hard for this. And then for all people of all ages to support them because this affects all of us. Everybody wants us to go to school and I want to go to school because I want to get educated. But climate change is so important that through school that I've learned that we need to actually do something. And with our power, we should all stand up and fight for what's right. I have a website, uh, petercamels.net. I wrote a book that came out in 2017 and it's all on that website online for free. Um, or you can follow me uh, on Twitter at, at Climate Human if you want, you know, my crazy rantings and you know I do this for you guys I do this for my own kids I do this for the coral reefs and you know I'm not gonna stop fighting